This is RT Sidebar. Stay tuned. All right. Hello. 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 All right. All right. All right. It's here at RT Sidebar. Today is going to be a phenomenal podcast. I hope you're all ready. Jonathan is between two bushes, I think, I guess the best thing to say, <laughs> which is probably one of my favorite, uh, m- one of my favorite skits ever, uh, between two ferns. If you have a chance, Zach Galifianakis, he's pretty awesome. So we have today, JV, I hope you're ready. We have a very important person. And I'm super excited because uh, Mr. Carl Hankson is with us today. He is uh, a friend of mine. We spent time in Waco. It's kind of the weirdest airport, maybe on the planet ever. But Carl and I had a great time. Uh, Super, super excited for this one. Talking about AARC and really the new era of AARC. So JB, this is exciting. What do you think? I am excited. Uh, There was a lot of questions that I had about the AARC. um, And I, I never really, you know. I would, outside of researching online or something and, you know, asking you questions, uh, <laughs> I think that I'm excited for this one. No, it's going to be awesome. Um, so, Carl, thank you so much for being on. Uh, funny story. So, Carl and I were both at the Texas Society for Respiratory Care, and we were at an airport that had two gates, but one of them was under construction, right, Carl? Mm -hmm. I think that's how it was. So, yeah, you and I spoke at the conference and we did our thing where you're supposed to, you know, go to airports two hours ahead of time. That's my normal thing. But as I've learned as president, when you fly around to some of these areas, these airports, you don't really need the two hours. So I showed up two hours early. I think I was 10 minutes ahead of you. I walked through the door and there's big construction, but there's nowhere, no one in sight. It's just empty and i'm like am i at the right spot and then i'm looking at my app to make sure that i you know there's no other airport and then i go up to the the one guy in the airport uh who's at the car rental spot and i say hey where is everybody he's like oh they won't show up to about an hour before the flights are supposed to fly out i said oh okay i went and sat back down and then you sat you came in you're like where is everybody Oh. And we sat there and, and watched as TSA kind of all five of them came out and ushered us through the through the that gates. So they had like the most sophisticated screening station I'd ever seen. I mean, it's like, wow, they did not spend, you know, they did not uh, spare any cost on their luggage screening insanity. thing. It was. It, it was insanity. It was like better than clear. It was unbelievable. And then you and I got to stare at each other awkwardly for two hours. That's always mm-hmm. fun. There yeah. You- <laughs> and then, you know, mostly like most airports, they got like, you know, a little cafe or something, a bar. This had two vending machines. <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, gourmet. It was and gourmet. not only that, the, the planes kept getting delayed, right? If you remember that, <laughs> the planes kept getting delayed. And I'm like, I kept telling you, hey, it's like an hour delay now. And then for the first and only time in my flying career, it actually shortened up. Instead of being an hour delayed, then suddenly it was like 40 minutes delayed, 30 minutes delayed, and suddenly it was on time. Yes, it was, <laughs> it was, it was so bizarre. It was weird. So it's Probably the uh, smallest airport I've ever been to. It, it, it was odd. Um, but we had a great time. We, we got to know each other a little bit. Uh, so for our audience members and for all of our flies out here, Carl Hankson is our president of the AARC. He's a current president. He's a fellow, multiple specialty practitioners of the year. He's currently the senior director of cardiopulmonary services and interim senior director of diagnostic imaging. I heard you were very good at x-rays. I did hear this. X-rays? <laughs> not not quite. I, I you know, it, it takes other duties as assigned to a new level. <laughs> I did was speaking to the medical director of diagnostic imaging, and he's asked me, are you ready to start scanning patients? And I said, no, not going <laughs> to happen. So one of my favorite movies is Nacho Libre, and he says dead guy duties. I need, I'm tired of dead guy duties. Well, Carl's tired, tired of X-ray <laughs> duties. So yeah. we're... <laughs> this is going weird, but we like it. So Carl is our AARC president, and I am super, super excited to talk about the AARC. 
you know, the ARC has gone through a lot of different changes over the years. And we've, we were pre-COVID, we were post-COVID, we were during COVID. Like, respiratory therapy as a profession has changed quite a bit. And Carl, you unfortunately were present, present during all of this fun <laughs> stuff. Uh, you and Sherry, I, I believe Sherry Tooley. Sherry, Sherry. Uh, so the, the COVID started, I think uh, maybe Karen Shell was president when it Karen first Schell hit. And then off, yeah. Sherry Tooley was the COVID president where everything got, sh got shut down. And then, and then I, I took over from Sherry about almost a year ago now. So, um, it's been it's been a tumultuous time for the profession, and I think it was a cathartic time for the board of directors and kind of re reevaluating the the mission of the AARC and if we were going the correct direction for the profession. And so I think the the board of directors, uh, the presidents, the chairman of the board of directors, there's 18 directors. Um, you know, you've got your VPs, uh, your treasurer, your directors are at large, and then your specialty section chairs, some of which are, are directors. Collectively, we decided we wanted to move the association into the, a new era, revitalizing the mission and making sure that the, the AARC was actually representing uh, the profession and moving the profession forward. So we I, I say we kind of flexed our fiduciary obligations and, and got some some changes made. And ultimately that culminated into the development of the, of the strategic plan that we did about a year and a half ago. So um, in the lead up to that, you know, the, the, we had, we brought back in Sam Giordano, who some people know him, but for those who are younger, <laughs> me, some people may, there may just be some, a, just a couple. Yeah, there's a couple out there. So Sam Giordano was the executive director probably for, I don't know, over 20 years, maybe 30 years, maybe 40 years. I mean, uh, he, he, they probably, you know, he probably built the building there, but uh, he came back in during some, some transitions and kind of assisted. And he, you know, his fresh perspective there, uh, you know, coming back and returning and, and kind of said, well, maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do that. And one of the first things he did is he looked at the, at the, where we were at financially and where we were at with our mission and said, you know, what, what the board ought to do is dedicate some funds for some strategic planning. And so one of the first things we did is we dedicated $5 million from our reserves to reinvest into the profession. And when we developed the strategic plan, we kept that in mind. So May of 2022, I'm going to get my years, years mixed up. We brought in probably 20, 20, individuals, the board of directors, members of the House of Delegates, members from our scientific community, and some other key individuals, and had a facilitated two-day event uh, mm -hmm. where we talked about what, what did we, what were the challenges facing the profession, where we needed to go, what needed to happen, and how were we going to get there. And uh, we had hired a new executive director. I think he was two weeks on the job literally two Dan, weeks Dan, on the job Dan, and here Dan, you are i think daniel said that i think he yeah. said he was two weeks like he's he he has all of like these big wigs of the of respiratory therapy the respiratory therapy giants of our profession and he's walking in and going uh hi guys yeah i'm daniel yep. <laughs> have a seat over funny. there we're going to be talking here about stuff yeah, exactly you know right. and uh, yeah it was uh i think a really um eventful I want, I want to overuse the word cathartic but it was a pretty good day you know of mm -hmm. us being honest with each other about you know what we've been doing and what we need to be doing and if we were going the right direction and, and how do we get to the right direction and what activities do we need to be there uh carl so, uh no sorry i was just thinking so when you were when you were looking at the challenges of our profession what was the the first few challenges that you were finding uh, well, I think one of the biggest challenges that at the time that we were facing that we were knew we were going to be facing, well, I would say there was two. Uh, one is the, the definitely the the shortage of respiratory therapists, which mm -hmm. um, we were just I, maybe if I, it's all kind of a haze. We were just really coming to grips of how bad it was, it's, and it's pretty substantial, and we're yeah. doing a lot of work on that. And probably the other one is is I would say the low numbers of members 
um, we were seeing the membership numbers kind of go in the wrong direction, which should be an indicator that we were not doing what the membership wanted. Um, and so, you know, kind of doing me doing my internal listening sessions on social media, on places like RT Breakroom, I kind of picked up on some things that, you know, people wanted us to do and be working on, maybe not members, but profession, you know, the profession wanted us to work on and kind of make sure that the board and the office staff were aligned on working on those items. So um, that's kind of the things that I, I was thinking about. There's, a, there's always a lot of competing interests. Those are things that I think about when I was there at the table, um, but there's others who had their own visions of, you know, what the challenges were. Did you see any uh, uptick? Because this anecdotally from speaking to people, I, I was hearing that COVID brought around a lot of retirements. And is that what you were seeing or is that in uh, conjunction? So you, we saw retirements, but we also saw um, program, uh, respiratory care programs enrollment fall off. Mm. So I know um, from, you know, some of my, uh, college education, we need about 7,000 graduating respiratory therapists pre-COVID to meet normal attrition, right? Mm -hmm. The schools mm -hmm. dropped off in that COVID era. They dropped off to around, you know, between six to five, 5,500 graduates per year. So when you think about that delta alone, thousands of, of job openings and postings not being filled by the grad, by the programs because COVID impacted their enrollment rates. And it wasn't just RT. Like I like oh, yeah. I got my DI hat on as well and it hit every profession. So we're not alone in that. Uh, you know, but certainly as an association, we need to be looking in that addressing that workforce shortage. So so I mean, like I've heard the stories about the strategic plan and all the big wigs that are sitting in Dallas and trying to figure this out. I love so a couple of things that I've, that I've gotten from it is that we you wanted to create a plan for respiratory therapists, not just AARC members, but respiratory therapists. And with that mindset, what were some of your priorities when you started building the strategic plan? Like what was the ARC comes comes together, they're like, hey, I need this. Because we believe that these are the most important things. What were those most important things? I think, you know, we think about advancing the profession. What is it going to take to advance the profession? Um, we've had challenges with, you know, people becoming respiratory therapists, thinking that it's career limiting, going to other fields. So one of the, the key features was the advanced practice respiratory therapist, right? Trying yeah. to make sure that was a part of the strategic plan and we were, were, we were building on that. So that was, you know, when we looked at this, when we built the strategic plan, it, it had five pillars. So it had engage, elevate, advocate, educate, and to organize. And so we made sure that in each of those pillars, there was um, items that work towards that goal. Engage the profession would be the engage pillar. Mm -hmm. Elevate the profession is also one of them. And so that was the APRT um, under the elevate um, uh, pillar, if you will. So mm -hmm. looking at that, and we've done a lot of work actually uh, in the last year on the APRT. It's really yeah. quite um, quite impactful. So when we looked at the um, the APRT, so I put together a task force, and it, the task force was chaired by. Uh, Dr. David Vines and Dr. Bill Croft. So David Vines is out of Rush and Dr. Bill Croft is out of North Carolina. Both have interest in, in the APRT. And so far, what we have is one program in the United States at The Ohio State University. You gotta say the. You gotta the, say you got, the, they, 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 Them's fighting <laughs> words for those guys if you leave it out. <laughs> Um, and so when I was president and I was doing my sort of like, what do it's, what's it going to take to make it a national reality to get to the end goal? We've got to have schools teaching a, you know, teaching the APRT. We got to have state licensure, and then we've got to have, um, you know, eventually, you know, we got to get paid by the insurance companies, and we got to 
have uh, a credentialing system and an accreditation program. Some of these pieces are in place, but it's really going to take, I think, a, a tremendous lift by the profession to get there. Um, so, but we were handed a gift this year. I mean, it was an absolute gift. Um, it was. It was. So, uh, at in Baltimore, um, Daniel Witt, the de department director of the RT department, recognizing that they had a substantial uh, gap in care for their patients with chronic lung disease, uh, he convinced the hospital to create an APRT job description. And they hired Mindy Conklin this year as the first paid APRT. And that was Hashtag a huge Mindy win. Yeah. Yep. Huge win. I, I, I got a chance to meet Mindy just a couple of weeks ago. She couldn't be a better advocate for us. Like she's the best spokesperson mm -hmm. ever. And then Daniel Witt is just like, go, go, go get him. Like, holy crap. Like that was so like, we couldn't have dreamed of that dream team. Like it's that good. So that is so awesome. Wow. And you know, my wife's a therapist and we talk about it. And we talk about the APRT and we're like, I wish the APRT was here 20 years ago. My career might have been a lot different. Mm -hmm. Might have yeah. been a lot, a lot different. JB, you still would be Dr. JB uh, <laughs> of clinical practice, maybe. So what else, uh, what other things like really jump out at you as a strategic plan that really engages respiratory therapists to become a member of the AARC? Uh, so some of the big things, and I think um, we, we definitely heard this from the membership, was about um, could we have done a better job of highlighting the profession during the pandemic? You know, certainly a lot of people like me, the volunteer leaders, we were, you know, our noses were to the grindstones. And so there was a general consensus, I think, um, that we had missed an opportunity. And so as part of the strategic plan, we really wanted to, you know, improve upon or close the gap on our marketing, ex or, you know, on our marketing efforts. And one of the things that we, we did do is we hired a PR firm um, that helped us do um, PR stuff, if you will. And how this worked is if there was a news agency that would be looking for, uh, say, they were looking for an expert on a particular topic, they would contact this PR firm, the PR firm would talk to us, and we would connect them with somebody and, uh, you know, do an interview or be a feature on something. And I can give you an example of this. So during the albuterol shortage, uh, there was some early morning emails like, hey, we need to find someone to talk to. I think, I can't remember who, maybe it was CNN. Like the they want to talk to a respiratory therapist about the albuterol shortage. And it was kind of short notice. And I, when I say short notice, I mean, it was like three hours. It had to be done in three hours. So I'm like, well, wow. okay, well, that's, that's probably going to be me then. Um, I, I spent some time kind of, you know, talking to a couple of people, making sure I got some background information. And then I did a phone call with, um, with the, the uh, journalist and then whatever I said got got published and so then you can go in later and uh, kind of read it online so I've been interviewed a couple of times and how and it's also parlayed into other respiratory therapists even being featured on like local tv news stations so Brady Scott at a rush uh, he ran an interview about uh, over, during the Canadian fires that was run on multiple news stations and so I think to date, uh, we've had over 75 media placements um, with featuring or interviewing a respiratory therapist. And it's in, in the online subscription phase, that's, as I counted up the other day, is 1.5 billion times a news article has appeared in somebody's feed featuring or interviewing a respiratory therapist. Whoa. So that is that that was one activity that we've been working on and trying to, and the whole idea is like, want to make move RT out of out of the hospitals and into the household names like so everyone knows what a PT is right you don't have to go too far trying to explain to people what a PT is if I could have a goal as president would to make everyone know what a respiratory therapist is and so they see the value that we bring and, and how we can improve outcomes for our patients with lung disease so that's something that you know we worked on uh, we're working on c-suite campaigns uh, trying to target the value of respiratory therapists specifically to the C-suite. Um, I would argue that through COVID, the C-suite 
definitely, if they didn't know who we were beforehand, they certainly knew who we are, know who we are afterwards. Um, but we wanna you know, capitalize on that efforts and kind of ensure with some targeted campaign uh, this year and next year that they see value in us um, and that we're kind of raised to the profile. And then I think in the couple of years after the strategic plan, we're gonna probably work on trying to make sure a pathway or enhancing the pathway to get more RTs into the C-suite. I think you know that is something that as an association advancing the profession forward, something we should definitely be looking at. As Sam Giordano would say, um, and I really enjoyed my time with him when he, when, uh, he was the interim executive director, he would say to me, Carl, if you're, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So. <laughs> that is such a good one. I, I, you know, Sam is like the legend. But I, I think it's interesting that you, you went to marketing. And Anna, we love you. You're our marketing guru. Jonathan, remember we were talking about we're ninjas? Yeah. We're ninjas. Nin ninjas don't have marketing programs. Yeah. <laughs> ninjas aren't so supposed like, to have marketing. You're not supposed to promote yourself if you're the ninja. You're supposed to be in and out, right? Bingo. But I've always thought that marketing was our biggest downfall. Like, we are badass, and nobody knows we're badass because we're ninjas. That, that has always been the biggest disappointment most irritating thing for me so whenever you watch movies or tv hospitals are run by two people doctors and nurses we don't exist no one else exists i don't know how hollywood thinks anything gets done in the hospital but they don't know we exist or anyone else and it, it is a little bit irritating and i i do like this battle between trying to get respiratory to the c-suite you know just in my career Really, I've had this battle several times at many hospitals, and what it comes down to for me every time is that there's only really one clinical person in the C-suite, and that's a CNO. And if you know nursing, they are not always the biggest advocate of respiratory. So that is a, a role that will suppress anyone coming out of our field. And so it is an uphill battle. You're going to have to find like those open-minded CNOs to to get up but it it's it's difficult otherwise i mean really the vp of you know ancillary clinical or support service whatever the hospital wants to call it that's usually where we we dead end and it's a shame because we are a voice that should be in that c-suite uh at every single hospital well jb what i would i would say um is I wouldn't paint all CNOs with a broad brush. I've reported to two CNOs in, in my time here and both have were very supportive of us. Um, but I would also kind of add that I think we are being noticed as a profession. Um, I am one of the reasons I kind of say that is in my role here at the hospital, I'm one of the individuals that rotates through as a hospital administrator on call. So mm -hmm. I, I rotate in taken those difficult calls, just like the CNO, CMOs. And I've met more and more respiratory therapists who are increasingly being tasked to do that. And I would argue because we are really good critical thinkers. Um, and that gets recognized. And that type of activity um, gains us entrance to those, the C-suite and stuff. So, you know, as president, I want to build on that. Um, when I when I was first started doing the hospital administrator on call, I felt like, well, I'm going to be one of the few RTs doing this, so I really got to do it well. But I think, um, and then I keep running into other, you know, directors that are doing this type of work, and and I think we are proving our worth, and I think it's just a matter of time before we kind of gain as much access. I mean, we're by nursing comparison, we're relatively small, but we are also very mighty as well. Uh, no, I mean, I did move up to. Um... Uh, what's the highest? I think I, I moved up to a senior director under a CNO. Um, but really the person that gave me the biggest lift into the C-suite area was, um, and she's now a CEO, is she's an x-ray tech background. And so she felt kind of similar to me, like, you know, we need to get other clinical voices at the table. Um, so it's just not all nurse dominated. Right. But really the, the it's kind of like if that C-suite can 
mirror what you get during grand rounds where you have all these different voices at the table, I think you get a better outcome. No, absolutely. I agree. So um, here, you ready for this? You ready for this one? How many CEOs are respiratory therapists of, re of hospitals? Do you know how many? Because I do actually know how many. Do uh, I have more fingers than that? Well, um, yeah. I think it's <laughs> five. Uh, five. So five are respiratory therapists. And a couple have actually left recently. There was uh, one out of Novon Health, fantastic CEO, fantastic respiratory therapist. I think at Brunswick Hospital. I met him once. Awesome dude. Uh, but there's not a lot. And here's no. the thing. Like, Carl, you've been AOC. Carl, at AARC, come find JB and say, hey, JB, tell me about you're the worst night of being AOC. <laughs> He's got a story that you can't even imagine. It is the craziest story that you ever had. Several, several. But we got to be bar side for this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you know <laughs> exactly this. right. A story you can't repeat on this podcast. Let's just say that. Like, it's like. Oh my God. But uh, it just, it, 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 it's so awesome. I love that you're highlighting the respiratory therapist. So to me, the AARC is really driving value. Tell us a couple last things about the value that you want to continue to drive while you finish up your presidency. Well, I think in the next year, um, I mean, there's a couple things that we've still been working on. I, you know, I sometimes forget everything that we're working on because we're working on so much. One of the the big ticket items that we started this uh, this work about a year ago was working on compact licensure, and that has been and that was something that we definitely heard from the profession like this is something that we want that we got to we got to work on. So when we were doing the strategic planning session, we made sure that was a part of the plan and it was placed under the elevate pathway, and uh, um, I when I was setting up the committees because when you're present. You know, this is how it works when you're president. Um, you have to come in and you have to create some committees are developed by bylaws. So you have an elections committee, you have this committee. But when you work on particular initiatives, you set up a committee to work on this initiative. And so you go find a chair and they find a, a group of people to work with. So for compact licensure, um, I tapped Ron Passawald uh, to do that. And uh, we, he very quickly was able to secure a list of respiratory therapists who wanted to work on this. And we, and, uh, we assigned Miriam, v, Miriam O'Day as our VP of Government Affairs to work with them. And they had their first meeting in, uh, at Congress in New Orleans. That was, I, cause I booked the room. So mm -hmm. I booked the room off the hotel. I, I met them at, at the start of the meeting. I had to run off as, as the group met for the first time. Really, their plan for this year, or my plan for them was just you just take the year and learn about compact licensure. That's all you got to do. It's all I'm asking for because the, the work may happen after that, but we need to know what it's going to take. And Ron and his team, they went far beyond that. I mean, they, 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 they're they knocking it out of the park. So um, this year we found out they got a depart, we got a, a grant funded from the Department of uh, Defense to go to the state compact he'll yeah i think you said you were going to have him on so he'll tell you all about it um but this group is going to create model legislation and it's really going to shorten the time it's going to take for us to to do that but you know as president i'm happy to see this work going forward and, and i'm happy to say that the aarc is happy to be maybe a little late to the game but uh happy to be leading this charge now you know what i like about the compact licensure yeah i mean it is a and, and uh, the fact that you listened to the masses and and made this a priority, I think it's fantastic. It shows that the ARC is not working in a silo. But what I really liked about it was, you know, during COVID, throughout the country, you would see uh, hot spots of COVID, right? And the same would apply to influenza. The same is going to apply to RSV. But then also uh, in California, we just had the largest healthcare working strike in the history. But there's so many hot spots that we need to be able to get people into quickly. And, you know, the ability to move around, I, I, I think, is a, is a patient safety um, issue as well. Because if, you, if it takes a month to get in here, uh, you know, you can't be much help. So I like this. I think it just speaks to that. We now we have a mobile workforce. We have mm -hmm. a, um, you know, when I came out of school, which was a long time ago now, 
Um, travelers are very much a seasonal thing. You know, at the, I spent 20 years at a trauma center. We use travelers mainly in the summer, but now we have a large mobile workforce um, and this probably is here to stay as long as we have the national shortage of, of RT. So um, yeah, this is, I think this is good work. You know, and as a former respiratory director, you know, as, as far as a budget goes, uh, travelers are just, you know, killer. But oh. the fact that you can have a workforce um, very quickly is, it's a game changer. I mean, until we have, you know, one therapist per open position, I think this is the ideal situation that's going to cover us until we can get enough RTs in the field that we don't need the mobile workforce. I mean, that's really how I see it, but it, it's just a necessary evil uh, at the moment. Yeah, I, I, so, I get, I'm still a director and I get that pressure quite a bit. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> so, so Carl, I want to finish up, you know, Carl, I hope you're ready because you're going to be on RT sidebar a bunch more times in 2024. So get prepared. What is your final thought when it comes to the value of AARC membership and why we as therapists should be a member? Um, so it, my belief is that it is the one organization that I mean, it is your professional home, right? This is the organization that represents you to the government agencies, to the other professional associations. That is your forwarding face to the rest of the world. It is also the organization, and people may not realize this, but the AARC is the only organization that's publishing your scientific journal. Respiratory Care, our scientific journal, your membership supports that. So your membership supports a lot of the activities that should be supporting you as a respiratory therapist. Now, my belief is, and I've kind of had said this in other circles, I don't want to beg people for their membership, but what I want to do as president is I want to make sure that the AARC is providing the value that you see, that you see the work that we're doing and you want to join us to be a part of it. And I, I will say that I think with the strategic plan, using it as our North Star, we're getting up a bit of a head of steam to advance the profession. Now, there's a lot of stuff we, we didn't talk about. We did an entire APRT summit a couple weeks ago. We're making, we're mapping out a roadmap um, on how we're going to make investments and to make the APRT a national reality. Um, we're going to be looking at how we map out schooling and other stuff. Getting, I didn't even, we didn't even cover to like how do we map out those, map out those invisible career pathways for people who maybe don't want to work inside the hospital setting or don't want to do an education. Those are those are works we're going to be doing next year, but. B, the AARC is the professional home for the respiratory therapist. I believe we bring value um, and increase the stature of your profession. And if you like the work we're doing, join and be a member. I what I, I think that's super, super simple and easy. I love it. I love it. JB? Yeah, I mean, not only that, you always hear that complaint. Oh, don't be a respiratory therapist. Go into nursing because respiratory is a dead end. Um, but if you're blazing these paths for the profession, it just, we're able to have many different ways to go. And it, it just kills that argument of, oh, well, you should be a nurse if you want to do anything in the future, right? So like just blazing the paths for our profession is a huge value. Yeah. And what, to be honest, what I've learned, Carl, and getting to know you a little bit, uh, getting to be part of House of Delegates, the ARC is not what it used to be. It's evolved. It's becoming a new profession, a new organization that's really driving the profession post-COVID. I believe that's your words, quote unquote. But I do believe that. I think that you guys are doing good stuff, and I, and I want to continue to support that. I'm glad that RT Sidebar and the AARC have a nice relationship. Carl, thank you so much for being on. We are going to talk more. We have a lot more to talk about, so get ready. Um, like I said, make sure we have uh, you have a, a nice tasty beverage when you talk to JB in national. <laughs> he's got a good one. Woo, he's got a story that is going to win. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to first off to Carl. Thank you so much for being a part of our podcast. Thank you so much for being a huge part of our profession. Thank you for, for being a great, great advocate. Thank you for driving value for the AARC. Another person that drives value is a friend of ours, Terry Miller. 
She has a great podcast coming up next week during respiratory care week on the 26th, talking about HOSA. And she, you're like, what the heck is HOSA? She's talking about recruiting people. And this is what it's about. And this is what the ARC is doing. So big shout out to all the respiratory therapists. Respiratory care week is next week, October 22nd to the 28th. We're super excited for, we have ARC Congress. If you want to see Carl in all of his glory, he loves all the attention. He <laughs> loves it. He'll tell you all about it. But ARC Congress is coming up in Nashville, uh, November 5th to the 9th. JB and I will be there. Anna Hayes, the froggy talker, <laughs> will be also be there. But, you know, check us out. Uh, we're going to continue to celebrate Respiratory Care Month because Respiratory Care Week's not long enough. And we're going to talk about hypercapnia and respiratory failure in next week's uh, Last Chance webinar. So I'm going to start us off with some shout outs. Carl, thank you to you and your team at the AARC. Respiratory Sidebar, RT Sidebar is going to be at the influencer table at the AARC. Thank you, Dana, for allowing us. We're super excited. We're going to have our, our friends there. We're going to be talking about respiratory therapy. So excited about that. Another big shout out to Carl and maybe some of my friends from, from Pennsylvania, Andy Miller, Jaron Juby, Caitlin Burr, Karsten, you, Carl, Cheryl Hower, uh, Brian Smith, and Kyle had a great respiratory care journal article this past month, Characteristics, Identification, Training, and Perception of Respiratory Leaders. Uh, just fantastic. That whole series that you guys did had been awesome. So JB, shout outs to you, my friend. All right. Yeah. And I also want to thank you, Carl, and for coming on and, and talking about the ARC and everything they've done for the profession. Um, I'm excited to see what our future holds, and I can't wait to see everyone at Congress next month. I mean, this is going to be really, really fun. Uh, and then uh, my shout out is uh, to uh, Angela Policronis. She's the backbone of my LinkedIn. Uh, she makes all the clips for me. And without her, I would be getting yelled at for Anna, uh, yelled at by Anna for not posting. So, um, you know, happy birthday, Angela, and I uh, hope to see you soon. And Carl, you got any shout outs? Uh, I do. I'd like to give a shout out to Jen Poling, uh, the RT educator at Queens Hospital in Honolulu, Hawaii. I was just there for the uh, chess conference. And while I was there, I managed to um, wiggle my way into uh, the Queens RT department and go and meet with the staff, and kind of talk about the AARC. But shout out to her for making it happen. So awesome. Anna Hayes. <laughs> yeah, on, on uh, the 6RT sidebar, we're going to brainstorm solutions to my sore throat. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, Jonathan, I'm still going to yell at you for uh, <laughs> not posting enough because never. <laughs> um, and you pronounce Angela's last name Polychronus. Polychronus. But Did I pronounce it wrong? Maybe, yeah. Uh, now, 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 two drinks, damn it. <laughs> um, no, my shout out this week to Dan Van Hise on getting um, the governor of New Hampshire to proclaim Respiratory Care Week uh, within the state of New Hampshire. So there's official proclamation coming out today. So happy Respiratory Care Week or happy about their Respiratory Care Month. Um, we're so happy to celebrate our teas and continue the sidebar discussion going. Uh, Carl, you did awesome. Like so many good stories today. Uh, yeah. so thank you so much for being on. Vapotherm does not practice medicine or provide medical services or advice. Any clinical recommendations provided herein are solely those of the speaker. Practitioners should refer to the full indications for use and operating instructions of any products referenced before use. Published Cone Hayes are employees of Vapotherm. Butler is a paid consultant and our guest is not compensated. Oh,